Good morning, Mr. Mishkan. Good morning, Sir Brian. Well, you can obviously hear me, and you can see me as well, I hope. I can. Um, now, I gather that uh, you, you are uh, at home, uh, and at home you uh, you have your, your wife and your dog. Um, no. But your dog is a, is a Great Dane puppy, uh, and is being kept at a safe distance so that there is no interference from either wife or dog in the course of your, your evidence. Am I right? You're quite, you're quite right, sir. Uh, well, let me tell you who you're talking to. Uh, you're talking to uh, a uh, fleet bank house, uh, a room capable of holding 200, which at the moment uh, holds, I, I think, um, eight people, including myself uh, and Mary, who will ask you to take the oath in a moment or two. Um, but the main audience uh, that you're addressing is beyond us. It, it is those who are watching remotely uh, on either Zoom or YouTube, uh, and there will be something in the region, uh, if uh, last week is anything to go by, uh, of about 240, 250 people at any one time. So that's the audience uh, that you have, that is whom you're talking to. Now, before Miss Richards asks you the questions, uh, Mary, would you uh, uh, administer the oath, please? Please state your full name. Russell Ord Mishkon. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall <clears> be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Mr. Mishcon, are you able to see and hear me? I am. Now, you became a trustee of the McFarlane Trust in March 2006, and you remained uh, in that position until early 2014. Is that correct? It is. You also were a trustee of the Eileen Trust, you um, were appointed in that capacity in around March of 2007. And, and is it right you remained a trustee of the Eileen Trust until 2018? Um, can't exactly remember, but I think that is correct. Now you um, um, are, you were a, a qualified solicitor. What was your principal field of, of practice? Initially, I would be regarded as a general practitioner. Uh, but uh, subsequently a commercial and commercial property um, specialist. What, what led you to um, apply for the position as trustee of the McFarlane Trust? Um, I've been involved with charities since my teenage years. Um, as a, My first trusteeship was in my early 20s. Um, I've always been involved. I've seen it as a necessity. Um, I had embarked on a master's degree course uh, involving charity management and I saw an advertisement uh, in the Times for a trustee. I think the advertisement was also for the chair of the McFarlane Trust because I have had a serious blood um, condition uh, and I had several transfusions uh, in the 1950s and 60s uh, and obviously was fortunate enough not to have been infected. Uh, I thought that I knew something about the subject matter and I thought that I might be of use as a trustee to this particular charity. What, what, if anything, did you know, um, either at the time of your application or, or, or in the early days of your appointment, about the circumstances in which the McFarlane Trust had been set up? Well, um, obviously, uh, doing my research, that is how I discovered what it was all about. When you say your research, you mean your research for your dissertation? Research for dissertation, but also research about the specific charity. 
I think you've told us that you received an induction pack when uh, you um, um, w were appointed. Can uh, I correct? Yes, of course. Um, I think the induction pack was uh, handed out at the Trustee Development Day in November of 2007, not when I was first appointed. Well, we may come back to the Trustee Development Day later, so um, I'll, I'll um, leave that for present purposes. Just in terms of your dissertation, um, I'm just going to put the, the title on screen. Um, I might ask you a little bit more about it uh, in the course of the morning. Um, but, but for present purposes, if we can just see the first page, Joe Mick, it's MACF 5029. And we can see there the title of it. It's the strategic challenges facing the McFarlane Trust, the effects of demographic change and lack of government funding on haemophiliacs infected with HIV, hepatitis C by NHS administered contaminated blood products. Um, how you told us, I think you were doing this as part of a, um, a degree course. Um, how did you come upon to alight upon this particular topic for your dissertation? Again, um, it was something in the Sunday Times, it was an article um, about this particular course that was being run by London South Bank University. Uh, because um, I never went to university after school, um, I had embarked on this as a, as a challenge. Um, but w what was it that led you to, to alight upon this particular topic for the dissertation as, as part of the degree? Well, um, I obviously was a trustee of the McFarlane Trust. Um, sorry, I became a trustee after I had started the course. And I felt that it would be um, something to be of benefit, possibly to the charity, um, if I did this exercise. Um, we can take that down for now. Thank you, Shimmy. Um Now, in the course of the... the your tenure at the McFarlane Trust, that you were a member of the National Support Services Committee for a period of time, and I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, you also attended some meetings of the MFT Caxton Liaison Committee. Can you recall what, what um, the purpose of that committee was? Um, in all honesty, I can't. Um, I think it was only a couple of meetings that I attended uh, in the early days of it. Um, obviously, all, all I think I can say is that we were trying to uh, set up um, criteria that would assist the Caxton Foundation based on the experience of McFarlane Trust. But I have no recollection of what was said or done at the meetings, I'm afraid. You, you were also involved with two working parties at the McFarlane Trust. Uh, um, there was a working party uh, looking at, in particular, uh, the position of widows and bereaved dependents. Um, is, is that what we see sometimes referred to in the minutes as the stage two working party? Um, again, I wouldn't know, but I will take it that it, it was. Um, um, what was um, the, the role or remit of the working party, whatever its precise label or name, um, the working party that was looking at the position of widows and, and bereaved dependents? Well, I think it emanated from the Trustee Development Day um, in 2007, uh, where Peter Stevens had set out um, quite clear uh, and defined objectives for the Trust going forward. And one of those was the position of the widowed community. And when I was appointed to that working party, I was not a member of the NSSC. Uh, and then the second working party that you were involved with was a reserves working party um, set up a, a little later, I think in around 2012. Um, what, what was the, the role and remit of the reserves working party? 
It was because we had substantial reserves at that time and the Department of Health were wanting us to reduce those reserves uh, and we were virtually put under the obligation to do so in order to have our allocation for the following year um, considered, I don't know if I should use the word favorably, but considered. And uh, <laughs> the issue of the reserves was a difficult one because the allocation, the annual allocation from the Department of Health was never certain and it was always felt that it could be withdrawn. If it had been withdrawn, what was an appropriate sum of money to have in order to reduce the effect on uh, the beneficiary community? Uh, and it was felt that I think around the £4 million mark that we had would cover us for a recollection, a year and a half, something like that, so that, as I repeat, the burden on the uh, community of having funds taken away from the McFarlane Trust would be lessened. But again, the Department of Health insisted on us reducing those reserves substantially, so the objective of the working party was to come up with proposals to do just that. I'll um, come back in a little more detail to the working parties and a couple of sets of minutes um, um, at a later stage. Um, before I do that, I want to ask you some more general questions about the McFarlane Trust and, and its relationship with the Department of Health. If we look at your witness statement, Mr Mishcon, showing that it's WITN 447-4001, And if we go to page three, please, paragraph seven. I just want to ask you a little more, Mr. Mishkan, about what you say in, in this um, part of your statement. So you say, the trust was not independent from the government slash Department of Health because it was solely dependent on them for its source of funds. I have described it as an instrument of the government, but it was established as an independent charitable organization. And then you refer to Mr. Evans' description of the trust as an arm of the government. Whether an instrument or an arm of the government, it should not have been, and to be either is, I believe, contrary to Charity Commission guidelines. Uh, whilst the Department of Health did not dictate policy to the trust other than by operating the purse strings and nominating two of the charity's trustees, neither did it, as far as I'm aware, exercise oversight nor involve itself in day-to-day -day matters. It was also intimated, as I recall, that if the trust sought to fundraise on its own account, any receipts would reduce the grant the trust received from the Department of Health by an equal amount. And then you set out um, your, your recollection as, as to um, uh, the basis of your understanding for that last observation. C can, can I just ask you to develop a little more for us what your view was of the trust's role and its interactions with the Department of Health and, and what difficulties or tensions that caused? Clearly, the Department of Health um, influenced what the McFarlane Trust could do by virtue of the level of its funding, because it was the sole source of funding for the Trust. Um, it is clear from having looked at some of the evidence that's been put before the inquiry that the department took a very, very strong line in relation to the reserves which we've just been talking about. And so to say, as I do in my statement, that it did not dictate the policy of the trust, um, that could be mincing words. Um, I don't know that I can say anything more unless you want specifically to refer to something. No, that, um, that, um that uh, answers the question, Mr. Mishcon. Um, you, you set out in this paragraph your concern um, um, that the position that the Trust found itself in might be contrary to Charity Commission guidelines. Was this something which the Board considered and discussed at 
the time or, or sought any advice on? Um, I refer to it in my dissertation, as far as I recall, and, and I think I quote from the actual charity guidance uh, policy. Um, I believe I would have raised that at a board meeting. Uh, I can't exactly recall if I did or when I did, but uh, there was a general view on the board of trustees that this had been done, you know, carried on for so many years, this policy that all the policies that it, it then had for payments to the registrant community. Uh, and it wasn't going to change that easily. Um, in, in terms of the ability to fundraise, um, it, is, is this a correct understanding of, of, of um, your position at the relevant time? Um, that the McFarlane Trust had the power to fundraise, but there was a practical constraint, which was um, um, that the Department of Health might then make a commensurate reduction in its allocation of funding. Is that it? Certainly, it, sorry, it certainly had the power, um, but again, it was felt by some members of the board that the cost of fundraising was known to be an expensive cost. Um, and given the indications or the, the, the feelings that um, it wouldn't go down well with the department, neither really was it the role of the trust, having been set up by the government to administer funds to the registrant community, that it would be appropriate to do so. We can the fundraising. Take, we can take the statement down, Shemek. What about the, the position um, or the question of campaigning? So campaigning, using the media, um, advocating publicly for uh, a, um, uh, a larger allocation to be made, drawing attention to the plight of, of, of the, the beneficiary and bereaved communities. What was well, your I'm... view on, on the ability um, and appropriateness of the trust doing that? Well, it was certainly something that was within its uh, power to do so. There are, again, charity commission guidelines um, enabling uh, charities within, within certain confines to uh, lobby uh, and to promote their charity. Um, and I was very much in favour of that, and my dissertation bears that out. Um I'm just going to ask you can to... I, may I just add yes, of that, that I, I thought that this was one of the ways, I'm sure we'll be coming back to the letter that I drafted uh, to the minister, but I felt that this was one of the ways and a very important one for increasing the profile of the charity <clears throat> so that the public could see what the effect had been on the registrant community of the contamination, um, the, the blood contamination, and, and that the government wasn't doing enough to provide support for that community. Um, and I'm just going to ask you to look with me at uh, one of the interviews appended to your dissertation or, or that you, you, you undertook as part of your dissertation work. It's with the Reverend Tanner, Shomik, it's MACF 5030 underscore 037. If we go to the next page, We can see at the very top of the page the date. So this is an interview, as I understand it, Mr. Mishkon, that you undertook with the Reverend Tanner on the 31st of January 2008. Is that right? Correct. And, and Shomik, if we can go to the last page, please. And if we look at the bottom half of the page. Uh, I just want to read out and then ask you about um, um, the Reverend Tanner's response. Um, you asked him this. You said, given our government's past record and its niggardly response, to use your word, 
even if Archer was to write a pretty damning report about the generosity of the UK government, given Treasury constraints, given all the news about the possibility of economic turndown, what realistically do you think the government's response is going to be? And this is the Reverend Tanner's response. I expect it to be the same as it has always been, that the government has only ever moved with regard to haemophilia and these particular situations after intense campaigning. And I think it would call for another intense campaign by the Haemophilia Society coupled with the McFarlane Trust. I can't see the papers falling on the Prime Minister's desk and him saying to his chums in the Cabinet, we really must do something about this immediately. I think something will only happen as a result of further intense campaigning all the way along the line of special payments one, two and Skipton. It's only happened after that. Uh, uh, from your perspective as, as trustee, Mr. Mr. Mishcon, did you agree with the view expressed there by the Reverend Tanner? I did, and uh, Lord Morris, uh, who I also interviewed, um, was saying very much the same thing. And um, <coughs> Baroness Kennedy of the Shores, uh, Helena Kennedy QC, um, had also indicated that really this is the only way that government would be moved if, if there was um, advocacy. Uh, and she uh, offered, and in fact did, um, um, uh, raise questions in the House of Lords that uh, I, with the um, assistance of the Chief Executive, um, raised. That's, that's my recollection. The, the, there appears from what, what the inquiry has seen and heard so far from um, uh, McFarlane Trust uh, Board minutes and, and the evidence it's heard so far, there seems to have been a reluctance on the part of the Board of Trustees to participate in in campaigning uh, other than perhaps through the lobbying the private lobbying of, of, of parliamentarians um, what was the response of your fellow trustees to suggestions that there should be more vigorous or active campaigning um, it, it wasn't really taken on board by them and, and did you get any sense of why that was the case No. Um, I want to uh, take you next to... Can I, I'm sorry, can I just add, forgive me, um, Ms Richards, uh, it was felt that this was the role of the Haemophilia Society that had conducted advocacy in the past. But at the time that I became a trustee, um, I think that it had uh, sort of ceased to uh, initiate that role. It did obviously take a part in the Archer inquiry, but uh, that wasn't, um, it, it didn't go further than that. Um, I want to ask you to look with me at a letter you wrote to the Minister um, in, as part of your research for your dissertation. So it's MACF 5030 underscore 017, please, Shamek. If we go to the next page, this, uh, Mr. Mishcon, is your letter of the 5th of March 2008 uh, to Dawn Primarolo, Minister of State for Public Health Protection. Uh, and um, you uh, set out the purpose of uh, writing. The, uh, I'm the, you sorry, Ms. Richard. Yes. You are, you are, you are. Um, can you hear me now? I'm sorry, Ms. Richards, you're breaking up. Yes, and, and you are as I well. I can hear you now, but I didn't hear anything you said before. We'll, um, we'll see how we get on over the next few minutes. We might have to take a break if problems can continue. Um, can you see the document on the screen, Mr. Mishcon? I can. Yes, I can. So this was your letter of the 5th of March to the Minister, uh, and you, um, you asked her for uh, the opportunity of an interview, is that right? So you could raise a number of questions with her. Correct. And if we go over the page... We can see um, some of the questions that you wanted to pose. If we look at the bottom half of the page... Uh, um, um, under the heading questions, 
uh, you uh, posed this question. Will you as minister give serious consideration to a further capital payment being made to alleviate the existing hardship, which might allow surviving registrants to provide for their own and their dependents' future with a degree of financial independence? You then raised a concern about the particular position of young people um, uh, and whether there was a special case for providing an additional capital sum to that particular cohort. You then refer in the bottom of that... Ms. Richard, yes. if not on this page... You on... If it's not on this page that you're showing on the screen. It's on our screen, um, Mr. M uh, Mr. I, I, I think we, we may need to take a break just to check the... Uh, the, the technology, yes. So, can you hear me all right? Mr Mishcon, can you hear me? I can, Sir Brian. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take a, a break. I can, Sir Brian, yes. Uh, we'll take a break and let the, the techies um, ha have a look and see if they can improve the connection. So, uh, I don't know how long that will be, Thank but uh, it'll be at least 10 minutes for those who are watching remotely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I gather we're now back up and, uh, uh, and running uh, on a probably a more secure footing. So um, shall we pick up where we left off? This Certainly. Um, Shemit, could we have back on screen um, the, the document? Do you need the reference again? Yep. If we go to the previous page. Um, so, Mr. Mishkon, um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the, the document paragraph by paragraph, but am I right in understanding these are the questions that you invited the minister to, uh, to answer? Correct. Um, um, if I can just add that um, one thing I feel quite passionate about uh, is Judge Creever's uh, report uh, and what I quote on page two, of, of what he said, it also happens to be in the preface to my dissertation. Okay. Um, if we go, we'll just get that on screen. Um, so if you go to the, the next page, please show Mick. So that's in the middle of the, the, the screen. Um, you say this, M Mr. Mishkan, I assume you are aware, um, this is you addressing the minister of what other governments have done in making more adequate provision for those in similar circumstances in their respective countries. I'm thinking of Ireland, Canada, and Israel. And then you refer to Judge Creever's report, and, and you quote this, the compassion of a society can be judged by the measures it takes to reduce the impact of tragedy on its members. No amount of money can make up for the pain, suffering, and premature death of those infected with HIV, hepatitis C, or any other blood-related injury. The financial burden of living with HIV or other blood-related illnesses can, however, be quantified for the purpose of providing financial assistance to injured persons or their families. And is, is that the passage that you had in mind, um, Mr. Mishkan? It is. It is. Um, and we can see if we just look below that, um, um, if we go further, thank you. The next question you pose of the minister was what criteria does your department use to quantify, evaluate and cost the financial burden and needs of the registrants of the McFarlane Trust and of their dependents? Uh, and then um, uh, you refer again to Lord Creever in the next paragraph and say, I would be interested to have your comments as to why in comparison to other countries, the UK government appears to have such little compassion using Judge Creever's measure for those affected by this tragedy. Um, uh, and you then set out a number of further questions. Um, I think it's right that you didn't initially get any response to this letter, and you wrote again on the 25th of March 2008, um, I'm chasing for a response, I won't go to that. But in terms of the response that you did get, um, WITN 4474005, please show me, the fifth page of that. We can see this is a letter dated the 25th of March. If we go to the second page,
we can see it's from someone in the customer service centre of the Department of Health. So is, is this right, Ms. Mishkon? This is the only response you got. You didn't get anything from the minister or, or, or those directly working for the minister? Correct. Um, and if we go back to the first page and look at the second half of the first page, we can see, um, uh, picking it up in the last three paragraphs, um, there's a, a reference in the last three paragraphs to um, the business case from the trust in 2006. It says the department concluded such a payment was not justified at the time. The situation has not changed substantively since then. The next paragraph refers to criteria used to quantify claims in a court of law. And then the final paragraph, picking up upon what you'd said about Judge Creever, said it's important to note when making international comparisons that the situation in Canada and Ireland is quite different as it was established that wrongful practices were employed in both those countries. This is not the case in the UK. Um, and then I think the rest of the letter really goes on to talk mostly about um, questions of stigma. So uh, just, th that's just, the just, just yes. before you, you leave this, this letter, the, uh, the paragraph beginning, as you will be aware, um, states uh, a number of things as though they were received fact. Uh, e each of those is, uh, in the light of the information we've had thus far in this inquiry, um, highly controversial, is it not? Yes. Yes. Each and every sentence, in fact. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so you, you, is this right, Mr Mishkon? You got no, nowhere, really, in, in your um, request for either an interview with or comprehensive answers from the minister? Correct. Um, we can take that down, thank you, Shumit. Um, can I then just ask you a little about what the Trust's approach was to trying to obtain increased funding from the Department of Health? You were a trustee, I think, um, possibly under three different chairs, Mr Stevens for a short while, um, uh, possibly Mr Fitzgerald, I think, for most of the first few years and then Mr Evans for the last um, two years or so of, of, of your trusteeship at the McFarlane Trust. Um, what was the strategy that was pursued by the board in terms of trying to get increased funding from the Department of Health? As I think um, I've intimated in my dissertation, uh, the McFarland Trust was not particularly good on strategy going forward. And I think one of the problems for that was because everything was dependent upon the annual allocation by the department. So no real planning could be done. But it did occur to me, and I said so, that we should have had a strategy for what the situation would have been post-Archer. Uh, and to do that, one needed to think of all the possibilities that Archer may come up with and how the government would respond to that. So um, that when there was a government response, uh, we had all our policies in place. So I hope I'm answering your question. Um, as I said, strategy was, forward-looking strategy was was not something that was felt by the trustees to be particularly important. And if we look at just w one exchange of emails from 2007, um, um, Mr Mishkon, it's HSOC 0028245. If we look at the second page, first of all, bottom half of the second page, We see, I don't need to ask you about the detail of it, Mr. Mishkon, but just so we understand what this is. This is a, a firm of consultants, I think, um, uh, producing a draft document uh, it, by way of a strategic case. And then if we go to the top of the page, we can see Mr. Harvey, who was the then chief executive, um, uh, addressing an email to the board of trustees saying action has been taken to develop a redefined strategy 
in respect of the business case funding long-term survival. Uh, and then if we go to the first page, I just want to ask you about your, your comments. Um, um, you say, um, so this is your email in response, uh, 18th of July 2007. Uh, you um, uh, say in the second paragraph, after some observations about the, the, the document, you say this, what is in my view far more relevant to a strategic case is the desperate health and financial state of our registrant community, which is not touched upon, our duties as trustees to fulfill the objects of the trust set up by the government, and importantly to indicate what other Western governments have done or are doing, whether by way of compensatory patients or financial and other provision, to deal with the issue of those infected by contaminated blood. Mr. Mishkin, would we be right in understanding that the what you're there doing is suggesting two components to a possible strategic case. One is to articulate the desperate health and financial state of the registrant community, and the other is to um, um, set out to government what other Western governments were doing. Is that right? Yes. W w was that ever done by the McFarlane Trust during your time there? Not to my knowledge. Um, and can you assist us with understanding why that was? I don't think I can, to be honest with you. Um, if we go back then to your witness statement, Ms. Mishkon, I, again, a question I wanted to ask you about something arising from, from that in relation to the Department of Health. Showing that it's WITN 44740001. And if we go, please, to page 5 this time and to paragraph 8.5. Um, you've referred there to um, the, the rejection of the business case in 2006. I don't need to ask you about that. We've heard evidence um, from those who were in involved. But at the end of this paragraph, you say... Um, in the last five or so lines, trustees were advised that at a meeting with officials of the strategy and legislation branch of the Department of Health on 10th of December 2007, the then chairman and chief executive of the trust were advised that another reason for the rejection of the business case was the absence of any discussion of empowerment of the trust's community of care. Um, what did you or, to your knowledge, your colleagues on the board understand the Department of Health to mean by um, empowerment in this context? I think it was to have policies designed to assist registrants, primary beneficiaries, uh, widowed community, etc., to move forward with their lives if that was at all possible um, and that involved perhaps education because um, I assume that you've had evidence that many of the beneficiaries were very young when they were um, contaminated and when it came to education either they were um, not well enough or because their life expectancy was so limited, uh, as and when they got uh, some capital payments, uh, they saw no point in doing anything other than perhaps spending that because they weren't expected to live that long. I think um, the uh, interview I had with um, Nick Evans, uh, I think it's Nick Evans, um, sort of pointed that out quite clearly. So it was a question of having policies that would help those who wanted to be helped, um, either by providing facilities for further education or opportunities, whether that was business opportunities or whatever. And in fact, um, through the NSSC, we did introduce uh, policies to that effect. And um, again, uh, 
I do refer to this in my dissertation, uh, but it was also raised by Peter Stevens at the 2006 Development Day. And I think that the aid memoir that was produced for that uh, Trustee Development Day is very, very important because Peter Stevens sets out in his papers his view of things that needed to change. Uh, and I have to say that I fully concurred with that. Uh, I cannot say that over the years all those things were put into effect. Um, to, to what extent then was the issue of empowerment um, something that the board was identifying as a relevant objective for itself? or something that was being um, t uh, driven by the Department of Health? Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Richards. I'm uh, having a little difficulty in, in understanding your, your question. Um, Let me put it a different way, Mr. Mishcon. In your statement, you, ex you, you tell us that the Department of Health rejected the bid for funding and um, for enhanced funding in part because of the absence of any discussion of empowerment yeah. that might suggest that the department was seeking to um, shape the direction of the the, the board's decision making would, would that be right to understand that yes i think it would but do we also understand from your own answer a few moments ago that the um, issue of, of empowerment was something that at least Mr. Stevens um, um, himself thought was something that the board should be considering? Um, if I, you can hold just for one second, I want to see if... Um Now, I can't find what I was looking at. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I thought um, that there was something in the aid memoir that would um, assist. Um, I do recall that the NSSC um, came up with policies for uh, providing funds that could be said to be sort of empowerment projects. And I'm going to ask you about the NSSC SSC in a few minutes, just so that others can follow um, what you've said about um, the Trustee Development Day, as you've referred to it on a couple of occasions, Mr. Mishcon. I'm just going to get the aid memoir on screen so that those listening know what, know what is being discussed. Shamik, it's MACF 5016 underscore... 086. And we can see here it's headed Aid Memoir Trustee Development Day, 4th of November 2006. And we can see um, a, a number of trustees present, including Mr. Stevens. Um, who was, I think, shortly to step down, and, and Mr. Fitzgerald identified as chairman-elect and yourself. It, it, is this the document that you were referring to, Mr. Mishcon? It is. Um, and if we just look um, over the page... ..we can see um, there's a presentation or address um, by uh, Ms. Fletcher, who's a solicitor from Berwyn... Uh, Leighton Paisner, I think. Um, key duty of trustees. This is at paragraph A to establish and respond to need. Um, need was identified as financial funding, the many and varied categories of support sought by the beneficiary community. Trust clearly had primary and secondary beneficiary constituencies. The level of financial support was a matter for trustees to determine, um, and, and so on. Um, um, again, we might pick up on some of these themes um, in, in a little while. Um, and then uh, if we look at the 
next page, please show me. If we look at the bottom half of the page, we can see a heading there, policy papers. Um, and it says the purpose of the two papers was to review possible shortcomings in the trust's approach in policy terms to financial support disbursement. And secondly, how the trust might refine its approach to dispersing financial support, taking into account need as defined by Ms. Fletcher. And then we see four aspirations set out for, by the chair, clearer targeting of funds, the need to question automatic payments, the stage where non-affected widows are no longer deemed to qualify for support, um, um, and uh, um, I'm not quite sure. I think the last then just refers to what's set out in terms of the, the debate. Um, it, it, I, we can um, obviously consider the document ourselves, Mr. Mishcon, but is, is there anything in particular about the, the discussion that took place at the Trustee Development Day and how it shaped thinking over the following years that you would wish to highlight? I don't think so. Um, I refer in my dissertation, I'm sorry to keep coming back to my dissertation, that um, not much was done subsequently by the board. Um, so obviously some things were done, but the, the main issue that is raised there, not only by the lawyers, but also by Peter Stevens, was the question of financial need. And it, it is said in, in this paper, it sort of actually talks about uh, taking note that there may be some members uh, of the registrant community who were sufficiently uh, financially sound that they may not require the regular payments that were being made. It was only a small proportion, but now nonetheless a proportion. Now, I want to ask you next, Mr. Mishkon, um, uh, still on the theme of communication with government, about the letter that you proposed should be sent by the trustees in, in January 2013 to the minister. We'll go to the version that you've exhibited to your witness statement. It's WITN 447400. Um, and um, we can see it, it says, Dear Minister, um, and then it, it is recorded as expressing the concern and dismay of all the trustees at the prospect of having the annual allocation of funds further reduced. Um, uh, we've looked at the letter with, with Mr. Evans, Mr. Mishkon, so I'm not going to go through every paragraph, but we'll see from it. Um, uh, it, it the draft sets out concerns about um, uh, um, what the likely allocation was going to be. And if we just go to the bottom of the page, um, you say in the last few lines, the business case demonstrates the capital needs of our community of care far exceed the amount of our reserves. Yet it appears our annual funding is likely to be further reduced in order that we're forced to utilize our reserves in making up the annual allocation. And then over the page, you refer in the second paragraph to, um, or seek to draw a comparison in relation to the Caxton Foundation, and then in the next paragraph refer to uh, a, a commitment made to the Thalidomide Trust. Um, um, our understanding, Mr. Mishcon, is that at a board meeting in January 2013, you suggested that, that um, a version of this letter um, should be sent to the minister. Is that right? It is right, but I do need to clarify certain things that Mr. Evans has said, both in his statement and in evidence to the inquiry. He first of all implies that this letter was drafted with other trustees, um, or at least one other trustee, and it wasn't. Um, it was introduced by me under any other business um, because it, there was no other place to bring it in at the meeting. It had been reported to us that the department were 
possibly going to reduce the annual allocation. And I felt that we needed to do something uh, quite dramatic. But as Mr. Evans had suggested that it was presented as a final draft that needed to be signed there and then, that is very far from the truth. Um, and it's quite clear that there are square brackets in that letter. Um, and it is also the case, from my recollection, that there was a suggestion at the end that if the board, sorry, if the Department of Health did reduce the allocation, then the trustees would have to consider their position um, as to whether they should uh, resign. Now, I'm going to take you back, if I may, uh, Miss Richards and, and, and Sir Brian, if you'll allow me, to the Trustee Development Day, uh, 2006, because on page two of that aid memoir, you will see reference to the resignation of trustees. If you just let us get it back on screen, Mr Mishcon, so others can follow. It's MACF 5016 underscore 086. Uh, as a matter of, uh, of note, uh, the document itself, I think, has the date the 8th of November, the uh, 4th of November, 2007. 2006. It, it, that's what it says, but the, the note, if you look, if you go down to the bottom. Oh, yes. Yes, you're right. You're right, sir. Just below the list of those who are present, it says the trustee development date took place on the 4th of November, 2007. Um, uh, and uh, I think that, that number, that date, is repeated at the end, I noticed. Yes, I, I think we can work it out. That, that, that may be a mistake, um, uh, um, not least because if you look in the bullet points further down the page, it talks about making a supplementary one-off payment in January 2007 yes. and preparing a framework for 2007-8. So um, I think that, combined with what we know about when Mr Stevens left and when Mr Fitzgerald took over as chair, might suggest it's more likely to be November 2006. So the, the, anyone reading the letter should, should bear in mind that it's likely to be 2006. Yes, we'll double check, but that's my current reading of it. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Mr Mishcon. So if we go then to the second page and look at the bottom of the page, I think this is the, what you were drawing our attention to. Um, it says under so this is obviously many years before yes. um, the, the letter that you were, are talking about now. It was clearly thought even then that the, res the trust board of trustees might resign en masse. And the advice from the solicitors, and I was aware of this advice even when it was being proposed, because it wasn't saying we will resign, we may have to consider resigning. I'm sorry I don't have any copy of the original draft of my letter and that the version that I exhibited to my statement uh, was from my computer which obviously was the revised version. But even with the revised version uh, Mr Evans was unwilling to sign. So if we go back then to the, the letter at WITN 44740004 Um, uh, um, what, why was it in particular that you, um, you wanted the trustees to send this letter? What, what did you hope it might achieve? Well, obviously, it was something that was far more forceful than what was being said, uh, presumably by Mr Evans uh, and the chief executive um, at meetings with the Department of Health. Uh, it would demonstrate that it was the board as a whole that felt this very, very strongly. And that if the threat were to be carried out, and I'm not suggesting for one moment that it would be, because as I referred back to the Trustee Development Aid Memoir, it's not lawful for all the board to um, resign on mass under charity law, um, that the publicity 
even the, the ability to say we are going to, the publicity would have been substantial. And again, coming back to uh, whether you know lobbying or whatever is something that the trust should be doing, because it would get publicity, because questions would be raised in Parliament, it was a way of bringing to the government's attention the outrage, as it were, that had occurred. Um, Mr a Evans, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, I, I think not inaccurately, um, said that, the, or expressed a concern that the letter was sprung on him um, at the meeting without following the proper process. Um, it, is that correct? And if so, why was that the case? There was no such process. He refers to standing orders. As far as I'm aware, there never were any standing orders. I had never heard or seen of any in the years that I had been a trustee. It was something that Roger Evans made up. I'm sorry to put it that way, but it's true. Uh, and Mr Evans also said in his witness statement, which I know you've seen, um, and in his oral evidence, um, that he suspected that the production of this letter was done with the prime objective of putting him in an impossible position rather than with a realistic expectation of it leading to increased funding. Do, do you have any comment to make on that? Absolutely not. And there were so many trustees, not the two or three that Roger Evans refers to, that were in favour of such a letter, I'm not going to say the letter, but such a letter being sent. And that is why I revised it and I sent it uh, to all the trustees and to Roger Evans, being the revised version that the board meeting had made certain comments about, and that is uh, the, the draft that you have before you. Uh, and then, uh, if we just look at... And I, and, can I just add, I'm sorry, Ms Richards, I don't think that it is such a letter that would have created problems with the Department of Health in the way that Mr Evans seemed to think it would and damage the relationship that he felt he had with the Department of Health. Um, Mr Evans and his relationships, um, it may be something that we will come back to. Um, um, j just before, I, I will ask you a little more about the, the, uh, as it were, the culture within the board, but before we do that, uh, and whilst we're still looking at the the aftermath of this letter, there were some email exchanges um, uh, when you revised your draft, and we'll just go to that, please. It's WITN 11220029. Um, if we go to the next page, please, Shay Mick, to start with and pick it up at the very bottom of the next page, just so that we can see the sequence. So at the very bottom of the page, um, um, Mr. Mishcon, we have Mr. Evans' email on the 26th of January to all trustees, I think, dear trustee. And then if we go to the next page, um, and we look at the, um, um, uh, the first paragraph, it says, in case you're still considering whether to send an individual trustee letter, I want to clarify a few factual points. And then if we look at the third paragraph, he refers to... Um, so it starts, several of you have asked me what influence DH has over the McFarlane Trust. The answer is a lot. Um, there's then reference to the, how the government could close the McFarlane Trust down. And then in the last sentence of that paragraph, it says, a DH appointed trustee challenging DH in the proposed way would raise a number of questions within DH about loyalty, for instance. Was it your understanding, Mr. Mishcon, as a, as a trustee not appointed, I think, by the Department of Health, or not nominated by the Department of Health, that those of your colleagues who had been appointed by the Department of Health owed some kind of loyalty to the Department of Health? No, that's um, not what I felt. Um, so, but I think what Roger Evans is saying um, is quite surprising. Uh, for example, I, I think Elizabeth Boyd who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, was a Department of Health appointee. And she was very much um, in favour of this letter sort of being sent. She was a very uh, intelligent, wise woman. 
Um, and there was one other trustee, I won't um, name him, who was a Department of Health um, appointee, who um, was supportive of, of Roger Evans um, on this. Uh, but I, I mean, maybe this is an issue that should there be split loyalties? Quite clearly, uh, under charity law, a trustee appointed to a board has to be independent of whoever has appointed them. I mean, and if I, they're, not, then they're not doing their job properly as a trustee. Um, and then I'm not going to go through the detail of this paragraph by paragraph. We looked at it with Mr Evans, but I want to look at your response, Mr Mishcon. So if we go to the first page, um, Shomik, and we pick it up at the very bottom of the page. This is you in response um, to the trustees um, and Ms, um, copying Ms Barlow. At no time have I suggested, nor, I do, nor do I do so now, that individual board members write separately to the minister. And then top of the next page. A letter signed by all trustees is what gives it its force and impetus. Uh, I'm trying with difficulty not to read into Roger's reply another personal attack on me. Trustees are not or certainly should not be puppets. All of us are entitled to express our opinions with moderation and to try and persuade colleagues on the board to a point of view. By sending you the letter I revised, following comments at a board meeting, I was trying to do just that. Um, and then um, in the next paragraph, you refer to um, a, um, an email you sent to Mr. Evans. Um, uh, um, and you say in that, I've made four revisions to cover the points of concern expressed by you and some trustees. Uh, you say, I still strongly believe that such a letter should be sent before a final decision is communicated to us. Notwithstanding Jan's expressed view, we have to take the battle to the DH and not just be an Oliver Twist asking for more when handing down the crumbs. Um, and then you say, further on, there's nothing in my view in the language or tone of that email that anyone should take offence at. I was trying to persuade Roger to my way of thinking, but clearly to no avail. A few lines further down, you, you pick up on adjectives used by Mr Evans. If the adjectives fractious and dysfunctional are appropriate to describe our board, what is the chairman doing to ameliorate such a situation? Um, and then you pose a number of, 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 of other questions. Um, uh, there's one particular paragraph I want to come back to, but before I do that, um, uh, um, what was the relationships, again, without, without um, um, naming um, individual members of the board, what, 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 what was the culture of, of, of the board under the chairmanship of Mr Evans? To what extent was there scope for disagreement and, and debate and challenge? I can only give a personal view, um, I believe it to be shared by other trustees, that um, Roger Evans had his own agenda. He did not like anyone disagreeing with him. Uh, I think other trustees had a few problems, um, but generally speaking, we were a cohesive board, uh, even under his chairmanship. I mean, I don't think you know there was any sort of real hostility amongst other trustees. Uh, it's quite apparent from the correspondence that he and I did not enjoy um, a particularly good relationship. I always felt that whenever I wrote to him and copied in either the chief executive or other board members that I was doing what I was meant to be doing as a trustee and putting forward a view. Um, and as I've said in, in these emails, that the objective is to persuade other trustees to that point of view, but if you fail, you fail. Uh, Roger Evans didn't have that view. It was a question of this is what's going to happen. And then um, if we look towards the bottom of the screen, it's about seven or eight lines up from the bottom, um, um, you say this in your email, I do not recognise Roger's statement that in the private part of the board meeting on the 24th of September, we agreed unanimously that it was essential to work corporately and present a united front. 
if such wording finds itself into the minutes, my suspicions about the recent past minutes will be confirmed. Uh, you also, I think in, in a later document, refer to um, concerns about minutes being tweaked. Can you elaborate on what you meant either by suggesting minutes were tweaked or, or, or by what you say here? Um, I was not satisfied that the minutes that we were seeing under Roger Evans' chairmanship uh, clearly um, gave the view of, of, of the board meeting. It, it's one thing for a statement to be a true statement, but if the minutes overall aren't a fair and accurate view of what was said in relation to a particular matter, then they weren't proper minutes, in, in my view. And, and I felt that what was said in minutes was restricted to uh, Roger's view. And there was some correspondence that I had, and I don't know if you have it, where I was asking for the minute taker's notes, which I knew from discussing with her that she had, and she also had, because she told me she had, um, the amendments, the tract amendments that had been made to the minutes that she drafted uh, from Jan Barlow and by Roger Evans. But uh, she wasn't allowed to... Well, no, what she said was, I can't provide them to you without permission. And so I said, that's absolutely fine. Please obtain permission from Jan. And I then get a phone call from Roger Evans to say, um, you know, what's all this about you wanting these uh, minutes? You're not going to get them. And I was surprised that since it was Jan Barlow who would have been the relevant person to make any decision on this, that clearly discussed it with Roger Evans, and it was Roger Evans who was responding, not Jan Barlow. I don't think I need say anything more. Um, I want to next ask you, um, Mr. Mishcon, um, uh, to look at w one passage in your dissertation. Um, so the dissertation is at MACF 5029, please show me. Can we go, please, to, um, it's page 70 using the numbered pagination at the bottom of the page, Shamek. It's probably going to be electronic page 80 or thereabouts. You try that and see where it gets us. Two pages further on, please. But I'm not going to go through the detail of the dissertation, which um, we, we, we have and, and have read, Mr. Mishcon, but if we can just look at the bottom of this page, bottom half. Th this is in the conclusion section of your, um, of, of your dissertation. Um, you say this, the strategic challenges arising from these conclusions can therefore be summarized as follows. Providing a viable and accurate assessment of financial need for each primary beneficiary and seeking solutions to meeting that need. Mobilising parliamentary and media support for additional financial assistance, both capital and income from the government, empowering those in MFT's community of care who want a future. Um, we touched, I think, on the second and third of those already, Mr Mishcon. Um, I wanted to ask you now about the, the first. You identify there as a strategic challenge, providing a viable and accurate assessment of financial need and seeking solutions to meeting that need. W what did you have in mind as the appropriate response to, to, to what you identify there as a strategic challenge for the Trust? Well, again, this followed from Peter Stevens' um, comments in the uh, working, sorry, on the development day back in 2006. And I felt that the only way to really assess the financial need of the registrant community was... Um, by having an independent uh, assessment done. Uh, the census forms that we were using at the time, and I don't know if they were sent out annually, uh, 
did not in any way at all could they be said to be um, giving the necessary financial information to determine whether a registrant was in financial need. And let me say straight away that 80% of the registrants were clearly, no question at all, worthy of the charitable definition of need, financial need. Absolutely no question. And probably a much higher percentage than that, whose incomes were more than £30,000, could be properly in financial need. But because regular payments were given to every registrant, irrespective of financial need, it seemed to me that we were not doing what we were required to do uh, in terms of uh, what our requirements were under charity law. So my view that if it was carried out independently, um, it would be clearly an accurate um, assessment, but it was obvious that there would be some registrants whether for privacy reasons um, or other reasons, would be opposed to that. Um, I couldn't see any other way, although it was suggested that, first of all, and this is a, a very fair point, that the expense of doing such an independent assessment would be such that it just would not be um, practical. It could have negative effects on our um, allocation of funds. So that did have to be taken into account. And it was also felt by a number of trustees that this was a policy that had been in place since inception in terms of giving the regular payments to all beneficiaries, that it would be wrong to change that. I think, again, if one looks at the lawyer's view given at the Trustee Development Day that I've referred to in 2007, 2006, um, that was wrong in, 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 in terms of charity law. You expressed the concern in your dissertation that the trustees might be in breach of their fiduciary duties and that perhaps legal advice should be sought. Was such advice sought, do you know? And if so, do you know what the gist of it was? I do know that it was sought. Um, I was told initially by uh, Christopher Fitzgerald that uh, I was going to be involved in the discussions with the lawyers, but uh, I never was. Um, there were not. There was not just one piece of legal advice. There were three in total, and each one was. Um, what's the word I need to use, um, had a, a cushioning effect because of representations that were made uh, to the lawyers. The actual question in the final uh, email of advice um, didn't really say specifically whether there was a breach or not. What it, they did say is what the consequences would be if there had been a breach and that they felt that the that if there is a breach of fiduciary duty it's a question of whether there has been a loss to charity funds and they felt that it would not be something that the charity commission would willingly look into because it would be very difficult to ascertain whether there had been any loss or to quantify that loss. And they also said from recollection that the trustees, and this is something that I had also said, had always acted in good faith, which is a good defense to uh, any such breach. Um, and that in, in their view, provided going forward, there was a proper ascertainment of financial need, everything should be okay. 
And I think I, I uh, proceed that advice. Um, that is from my recollection. And before we leave the topic of your dissertation, I want to look at a document that well, seems... May, may, I, may yes. I just, just ask? Uh, I'm struggling to understand your expression cushioning effect. But in some way there may have been a cushioning effect on the advice given by the lawyers uh, from the nature of the questions asked or representations um, I, made. Brian, I am surmising that the initial advice that was received was not well received by um, the chairman and maybe also by the chief executive. Um, and they, I am aware that they went back to Berwyn, Leighton, Paisner um, with a view to the advice being, I use the word cushioned, um, amended. want to look at a document that appears to have been produced in... Sorry, can I... Forgive me, I should add that Christopher Fitzgerald did not agree that there had been um, a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, I'm going to ask you to look at a document that I think was produced internally within the McFarlane Trust um, commenting on your dissertation. Shame, because it's AHOH5064... It's a document headed, Possible Reasons Why the Board May Not Wish for Russell Mishcon's Dissertation to be Published. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through um, the, the detail of it, but if we just go to page three, please, Shamek. Bottom half of the page. You can see by reference to page 69, there's um, a quote from your dissertation um, in fact, I think it's a quote from the Reverend Alan Tanner's interview set out. And then the observation is made, I am sure the DH would object to an MFT trustee publishing these comments. And then we see the comment on page 70, just a little further down, um, uh, um, is three lines in, should a trustee be disclosing publicly the DH's strategy on future funding? And then if we go over the page, top of the page, we can see something being identified as very critical of the board. If we go down to the bottom of the page, we see the, the uh, not the bottom entry, but the one above that, uh, it's being identified that Mr. Uh, the Reverend Tanner was highly critical of government in his interview responses. Um, and then if we go to the next page, where it says about 10 lines down, section two, page four, it says Peter, that's I think Peter Stevens is critical of ministers slash officials at a couple of points. Now there's a number of other detailed points made, but it would appear that um, um, in included amongst the possible reasons why the board might not wish for the dissertation to be published was the fact that it included criticisms of the board and criticisms of the Department of Health. Um, um, were you, um, did you see this document at the time, as far as you can recall? I can't recall seeing this document. Um, the minute... Can I, I, need to, I need to clarify something here. Um, talking about publication, uh, anybody would think that, you know, one wants it to sort of, I don't know, be published to the world. Um, if it, it would, the intention was only that the university would put it on its website. And the reason, and the only reason why I was persistent, and I was quite prepared to have all references to the McFarlane Trust redacted, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was that, and this might sound as though um, I'm blowing my own trumpet, which I have no intention of doing, but it will probably come over this. This dissertation apparently had been given the highest ever mark by the business department of the university, and they wanted to use it as an example of how a dissertation might be put together. 
So it was only in relation to the university and it publishing it on its website rather than a, a general publication. And did, did, did you understand why some would, um, it would seem possibly within the McFarlane Trust, were concerned about um, a, a trustee publishing in the way in which you've described criticisms of government or of the trust? Well, um, we should all accept criticism, and the government is criticised on a daily basis. You only have to look in the press at the government being criticised about its, its COVID policy. So I, I really thought that this sort of thing, and reading this, um, is a bit of a nonsense. It was prepared, I believe, by Nick Fish, who was assistant to the chief executive. And he was probably just doing his job, having been told to go through it and, and see, you know, whether there was anything that uh, we should be concerned about. So I should say that the, the, the trust should be concerned about. So I note the time. Um, yes. I've still got quite a few questions for Mr. Mishcon. Um, um, and we've had a semi-break, but not a proper break. I don't know whether you want to take perhaps a shorter break now. Uh, yes, well, well, we'll take a break until five past... Twelve. Uh, it allows uh, you to have a, some refreshment, uh, knowing that you have the time to do so on this occasion. And the same for those at home. Now, uh, at any break uh, in uh, evidence, since you're giving evidence, you must not, you're not at liberty to, uh, talk about the questions you have been asked, the answers you've given, uh, or the answers which you think you may yet give uh, as your evidence continues. You can talk about anything else you like, but you can't raise those with your wife or anyone else uh, in the meantime. Uh, I look forward to seeing you back at five past twelve. Thank you, Sir Brian. <laughs>